Hi, I'm Ed Warner, and I'm going to continue this uh, kind of example, which uh, was an example of a vast collaboration of various uh, stakeholders. And uh, I have a similar story uh, with a very uh, rocky uh, 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 history to it. So there's good news, there's bad news, and then there's good news. So in 2004, there was a lawsuit. I'm sorry, Wynn, but I'm not really a fan of lawsuits. There was a lawsuit to uh, list the greater sage grouse in the Rocky Mountain West. The greater sage grouse is a ground nesting bird living on the sagebrush steppe. And the habitat, the historical habitat of the greater sage grouse covers 200 million acres of the American West from northeastern California, a little bit in uh, Washington, across the Rocky Mountains into Saskatchewan, uh, and all the way into Colorado. So a vast amount of territory would have been subject to a very big regulatory change in the way land use was going to be managed uh, if this was listed. Six months later, uh, a friend of mine who worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in their Washington office uh, called me up, and we went out to coffee in Denver, Colorado, and in two hours, we created the framework for what we ended up calling the Cooperative Sagebrush Initiative, which was a voluntary initiative among all the potential stakeholders. Nobody was going to be excluded from participating in this on a voluntary basis to do enough stewardship to recover sage grouse populations to the point where it would never have to be listed. Now, I want you to think about this because even though these were very, very good people, without the threat of the Endangered Species Act, we probably could not have actually motivated them. There is a vast economic interest that we all should consider, which is actually not part of the ESA and which has become a kind of a sticking point. And so why on earth would a guy from the government come to somebody who is an independent philanthropist and ask him to participate? And as all strange things happen in life, you have accidents of fate which you can take advantage of if you're lucky. And in this case, I was an oil and gas geologist, independent, with two clients who came up with an absolutely crazy, out-of-the-box idea, which ab nobody in my profession believed. In fact, they knew I was wrong. And so when I presented this crazy idea to 27 different companies in the Rocky Mountains, I got turned down 27 times. And it happened to be a hidden geological feature that nobody anticipated except I can't explain why, me, we had to keep the darn thing. We had to keep the third largest gas field in the history of the US because we couldn't even give half of it away to get some of our money back. And so what Carl Hess Jr. was coming to me for was entry into the industrial side of the equation, the energy companies, natural gas, fossil fuels of different kinds, coal, the transmission companies. By an accident of fate, everybody knew who I was, and I could knock on the door of a small or a major energy company and not get turned away. Energy companies had been labeled the enemies of the environment, and they were pretty bitter about this. And so no environmental group, no matter how well-meaning, was going to get in the door. And it worked. We did not exclude anybody. It was the state and federal agencies. It was local working groups. Uh, industries of different kind, including transmission companies and utilities. It was the tribes, the private landowners, the various communities that would be impacted by all of this. And we put together this enormous cooperative group to do public-private partnerships and work on private lands to restore sage-grouse habitat so that the sage-grouse uh, would be recovered uh, by private landowners and public-private partnerships. We had to come up with some really radical approaches to how to get this done because on private lands at that time, there was an enormous fear of the Endangered Species Act. Literally, if you went up to a rancher in Wyoming and said, I want to walk on your lands, he would say, do you work for the government? And you might have a 12 gauge, actually, <laughs> over the guy's arm. It happened to me. So, so there was a huge 
antipathy towards government actions. There was a huge fear factor involved. How on earth are you going to get those guys who have the land to be involved with government agencies that they fear, with, with oil and gas companies who had never supposedly at least given a hoot about the environment? And so what we did was come up with a whole bunch of really, really creative arguments and approaches to things. So if you would ever travel across, say, southwestern Wyoming, where there are private lands and grazing rights allotments and ranchers uh, control very large landscapes of both government and, and their own private fee simple lands, you would discover that there are no fences. And so one of the consequences of something like ESA would have been to segregate lands because only Government lands could be managed by government agencies that have to be sequestered. It would actually cause fragmentation, the opposite negative consequence of what you actually wanted. So you wanted to preserve the fact that these lands were unfenced and could be managed as a public-private partnership. And so we had an argument for the ranchers to keep their lands accessible to them and not have this thing happen to them. Then we, I went to the oil companies and I said, hey guys, a grazing rights allotment rancher knows that if he eats all the darn grass, he will not have places to graze next year. He's already become a grassland ecologist. He doesn't ranch anymore like his grandfather and his great-grandfather. He's a scientific manager of the land already. And he has an ethical responsibility, remember the Sand County Almanac and Aldo Leopold, towards treating that land properly, even though he doesn't actually own it. Just because he's a lessee doesn't mean that he doesn't have a responsibility. So I looked at the oil company executives and said, so do you. <laughs> so do you. Just because you have an oil and gas lease, you're affecting the surface. Under the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, everybody loves acronyms, you have a responsibility <coughs> called a mitigation expense when you develop to have an environmental offset. And I said, I want to convince you that we have an ecosystem services model that would work. And we flew them to projects where it was working. And then I took all the environmental groups and I said, I want to show you what an actual big natural gas development looks like so that you don't think that we ought to be doing conservation there. And flew them all up to western Wyoming, to Jonah and Pinedale Fields, which were industrial sites. Why would you want to have on-site mitigation on a Walmart parking lot? That's nuts when right over the hillside down there was really critical habitat along the Green River, winter habitat for sage grouse, summer habitat for sage grouse, why not spend mitigation off site? Totally revolutionary. Why not do ecosystem services payments? And we funded this, and what we did was we did not do Wyoming. It's actually too big. We went to northeastern California where there's an isolated sage grouse population where we could do demonstration projects very much more simply. And we got the largest conservation innovation grant from the Department of Agriculture ever issued with matching funds from energy companies, the Bradley Fund for the Environment, and other organizations. And we got it all together. They said, Ed, we want you to be the president of the governing board. And I looked around and said, I am never the chairman or the president of every, anything. I lead directly from behind. And so the Sand County Foundation stepped up and the president became the governing council. And I want you to go back to the name, Cooperative Sagebrush Initiative, not sage grouse. This was about biodiversity. This was not about a single species. Now, that's a smoke screen, of course, because the sage grouse was the most critical. But there were pygmy rabbits, and there were all kinds of other obligate species that, for me, were just as important. Biodiversity, more important than recovering one single species, because that's a long-term goal. That's a very bigger landscape vision. And guess what happened to us? In three years' time, the federal agencies co-opted everything with a couple of state agencies. They were afraid of two things, that people working in a cooperative would get credit for doing conservation on private lands better than they do, and they would not have control of the money. And we got totally shut down. This concept of off-site mitigation was a tremendous threat to the BLM because they had control of that money. And I knew that there was a problem in their process because in my own great gas discovery, I was in charge of the, the, the uh, environmental uh, impact statement, the EIS. 
And guess what happened? We, chucked, we coughed up $28 million, and they built a $19 million office for themselves in Pinedale, Wyoming. Mitigation of environmental impact? Hello? Excuse me. We wanted to see every penny that go on the ground, but also go on the ground where it would do the most good. And so we got totally blown out of the water. It was reconfigured into the Sage Grouse Initiative, SI instead of CSI. <laughs> and it was done with the local working groups that we had identified, with the fish and game agencies that we had identified. All the partnerships actually played out. And while I never get any credit for it, I wanted to give the credit to the people who were doing it anyhow. And so be careful what you ask for. You might actually get it. And 11 years later, that would have been two and a half years ago, the Secretary of Interior uh, in Denver, Colorado, made the first announcement, which was that the subpopulation in California, Northeastern California, had been totally recovered on private lands and would never be listed. And then, as you know, one year later, she made the announcement in the same place at the old uh, 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 federal uh, 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 reserve that is now, a, it, it used to be a, a toxic site, and now it's a game preserve uh, in no northeast of Colorado that the sage grouse would never be listed, that the lawsuit was done and it would never be listed. And what she quoted as the success was a combination of federal agencies, public-private partnerships, and conservation on private lands as the key to success. Thank you very much. <laughs>